All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sam Southam. I'm one of the two musculoskeletal radiologists at Travis. Uh, you've already heard from uh, Dr. Lance Edmonds, who uh, I have the pleasure of working with. Uh, for the next few moments, I'll speak about some of the uh, ultrasound-guided interventions of the wrist and forearm. And uh, I won't cover everything, but I think I'll give you a, a good uh, example of the most common procedures and indications. Uh, just an overview of what I will be talking about, uh, some general ind indications, both generally and specific to the wrist and forearm. Uh, consent and complications I won't spend much time on. We've uh, had a few people mention uh, in their uh, presentations uh, the uh, main points of that. Uh, technique and positioning unique to hand and form inter uh, wrist and forearm interventions. Uh, briefly touch on uh, dosage considerations. Uh, Post-procedural uh, care and uh, most of the time will be spent with specific examples. Uh, generally, in the wrist and forearm, as with anywhere in the musculoskeletal system, we're going to have indications either to be a diagnostic or a therapeutic, and uh, fluid aspiration of a joint or of a tendon sheath um, is, uh, is a common indication for a diagnostic uh, ultrasound-guided procedure, either to evaluate for infection or inflammation. Also diagnostic purposes, synovial biopsy or uh, soft tissue mass biopsy. Again, uh, Dr. Campbell spoke, uh, spoke about that a little earlier. Uh, most of what we do at Travis are therapeutic injections, um, either uh, aspiration of uh, ganglion cysts or injections of uh, steroid or anesthetic, anesthetic uh, medicine into a joint or a tendon sheath or potentially into the soft tissues. As with any procedure, uh, we always get uh, informed consent, uh, including a uh, signed and written document placed on the chart. Uh, uniform, uniformly, uh, the, the um, risks are the same as, as injections elsewhere, uh, but the uh, risk of steroid is increased in the uh, smaller parts in the hand, forearm, wrist, fingers, toes, uh, because you're closer to the surface, so the patient is more likely to experience the risks of uh, uh, pigmentation, atrophy, dermal thinning, uh, the uh, telangiectasia formation, at least noticeable to them, and local flare can also uh, occur in the forearm or wrist. And uh, again, with, this, uh, with the complex anatomy and the smaller parts, uh, you may have increased uh, risk of injuring uh, the small vessels or neurovascular structures uh, in the area. Uh, we've had a few uh, lectures on technique and positioning. Um, I won't reiterate uh, or try not to reiterate what they've already said, but uh, patient comfort is most important uh, when you're doing intervention. Uh, so that the patient doesn't move, especially once you've got a nice uh, approach lined up on your ultrasound and you're following your needle. If they're comfortable and you're comfortable, then uh, you'll have less uh, likelihood of uh, missing your target. Uh, we use high-frequency linear array transducers, and Dr. Edmonds talked about the hockey stick, which we prefer for our smaller parts. Uh, it's got a smaller um, footprint and allows you to work around the small joints easier, still uh, using either your transverse or longitudinal needle approach. Again, universal precautions. I think everybody's pretty aware uh, that we should uh, be doing that. Uh, sterile technique, including either a sterile uh, probe cover or potentially a Hibiclens gel prep, which also works nice as a coupling device, uh, so you don't need the ultrasound gel. And uh, either longitudinal or transverse uh, orientation for your needle approach. Now, Dr. Campbell talked about steroids, and uh, and I'm just going to reiterate this because I've, I've put it in a different form, but it, it is exactly what he has uh, talked about earlier, and it's in your should be in your uh, lecture notes as well. Um, but they are different uh, in potency, solubility, uh, cost, and uh, whether they're fluorinated or not. And with each of those comes pros and cons. Solubility, the less soluble, the longer course of action, but the increased risk of deleterious effects to the soft, soft tissues, such as dermal thinning, atrophy, or discoloration. Fluorination has been associated with uh, some of those effects as well, and uh, and then the potency or the relative strength. So this is a uh, chart that I've taken uh, from Dr. Krim's textbook, Arthrography, uh, which was uh, put out about two years ago. And uh, in order of uh, solubility on the left, most, uh, most soluble at the top, least soluble at the bottom. You can see that the phosphate-containing compounds tend to be more soluble than the acetate salts. Uh, relative strength, uh, excuse me, the strength uh, that they that they come in, and then the relative strength in the middle column uh, with uh, hydrocortisone as the reference is one. So these are all in in relationship to how strong they are compared to hydrocortisone. You can see that some of these, like celestone, are, are are most potent, and some of the more commonly used ones are, are not quite as potent, such as Kenalog. And uh, presence or absence of fluorinated compounds as well. So I find this to be a helpful chart. Um, you may 
consider, um, for example, if you're injecting into a soft tissue, not within a confined sheath or a joint, uh, using something that's a little more soluble and not fluorinated, whereas if you're injecting into a joint itself or into a tendon sheath, you could consider uh, a less soluble compound in the presence or absence of uh, fluorinated compounds wouldn't be as, uh, as, as uh, pertinent. Post-procedure, really not a whole lot different than anything else you're going to do uh, in the musculoskeletal system. Now, with the exception of uh, a ganglion cyst aspiration, uh, people advocate uh, uh, not using the joint for at least 48 hours and putting a compression dressing, dressing on the wrist uh, to help decrease the risk of uh, reaccumulation of fluid in the short interval following the procedure. All right, we can get to some pictures finally. <clears throat> so this is a, an example of a ganglion cyst. And ganglion cyst aspiration is going to be our most common indication, at least one of the most common things that we do in the wrist. And the indications for aspiration are listed above. Most commonly, we see people that are limited in duty and are on profile, and we're asked to, uh, to treat the ganglion cyst. But there's also some other risks, such as nerve compression, ulcer formation if there's a tense, uh, dermal tensing from the cyst itself, or local trauma. As Dr. Campbell mentioned, when you're trying to aspirate a ganglion cyst or a paralabral cyst or any type of a musculoskeletal cyst that has uh, this thick, mucinous, gelatinous fluid in it, you're going to need a big needle. Um, even with an 18-gauge needle, it can sometimes be very difficult. You may even need to upsize to a 16-gauge. But if you're trying to get uh, a 20 or a 22-gauge needle and trying to get fluid out, it's going to be really, really, uh, really hard to do. I've, I've struggled a few times with, it, with a 20-gauge and then you upsize to an 18, uh, and, it's, and it's much easier. Some, uh, some people uh, opt to inject steroid or a hyaluronidase into the ganglion after it's been aspirated. I have not yet seen any uh, literature to uh, suggest that that is necessary or that there's a, a difference, but uh, some people do that and, and there are, are relatively few side effects of that, so that would, that's an appropriate uh, treatment as well. And then the comp compression dressing. So this is an example of a uh, Volar ganglion cyst on the radial aspect of the wrist that we saw on MRI. And we've got the fluid sensitive sequence post the GAD sequence. And you can see that uh, we have this ganglion cyst, which is conveniently interposed between a couple of large vascular structures in the wrist. So obviously, the uh, orthopedic surgeon didn't want to necessarily drain this clinically. And um, we have the uh, luxury of having a really good working relationship with our specialists. The rheumatologists and orthopedic surgeons are great. And uh, we trust them, they trust us. We've got a really close working relationship. So one of them walked over the office, uh, over to us, just like Dr. Tall described. It was kind of this ideal situation. Uh, said, this is the patient, this is what I want. And we were able to bring them in. Interestingly, I don't think that this projects very well, uh, given the, uh, uh, but uh, the patient also had some, uh, when we talked to them, had some uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, symptoms, as well as increased signal in the phenar musculature. Now, I know you're thinking, what would a radial sided cyst be doing causing a, a carpal tunnel uh, or median nerve distribution, um, paresthesia, and denervation pattern? And, I, and I'm not sure I've put that together yet unless the mass of this compromised had mass effect on the carpal tunnel, or perhaps it was true, true, unrelated, but it was interesting to, to elicit this history from uh, the patient as well. So we did a pre-procedure localization scan, which uh, helped us identify the vascular structures uh, with the conveniently positioned ganglion cyst. Um, and we identified an appropriate uh, entry site, uh, longitudinal approach, which allows to go between the vascular structures, uh, accessing the majority of the cysts as well as the, the uh, lobulations and septations. Uh, we thought that if we were just to access it kind of in this fashion, that would uh, provide the, the most optimal approach. So after a written informed consent, the patient is positioned. This is just uh, her hand down at her side. A uh, large field uh, is prepped in case we need to uh, reposition our transducer, so a large, a large area of uh, preparation around the, uh, around the wrist, and then uh, sterile covering just to uh, keep the patient clean uh, and uh, decrease the risk of infection. <clears throat> so this is uh, the, uh, before we do the scan preparation, we, you can see here the, the hockey stick, high-frequency linear transducer. Uh, that we're putting the sterile probe cover on. It's got a small footprint. It's often easier to use when injecting the small joints um, <clears throat> that we talked about before. Now, I know that uh, HIPAA pertains to patients, and you're not allowed to show a patient if it has a, a face or defining birthmark or something like that, but it does not apply to physicians. And so you may be wondering who's actually doing this injection. And uh, as far as I know, 
I don't have this tattoo on my forearm. So this is definitely Dr. Lance Edmonds who performed this injection. <laughs> I think he picked that one up during fellowship, if I remember right. Um, so uh, before the injection, there's a uh, pre-procedure localization scan. Just now everything's sterilized. Um, and you can see the uh, hockey stick as we're localizing our site. Using a longitudinal visualization, the aspiration, this is after very generous local anesthesia administration. You can see we've got an 18-gauge needle, a uh, big 18-gauge needle, and a 5cc syringe uh, watching as we go in. Here you can see the needle as it's coming into the, uh, to the ganglion cyst, ring down artifact from the uh, echogenic needle, needle and perhaps the presence of air within the bore as well. And this is just a uh, cine loop showing uh, as we advance the needle in a little bit of uh, to and fro motion during aspiration uh, as we're kind of fenestrating the, uh, the cyst as well. <coughs> and afterwards, I don't know if you can see this real well, but you can see some of this uh, kind of slightly yellowish uh, gelatinous material. I'll, I'll highlight it for you, but it's filling the, filling the syringe. And if you've ever had a chance to play with this stuff, it's actually very... Uh, Amazingly engineered. It's ex extremely tenacious, very um, viscous, but very, very slippery. It's, it's uh, it, much more so than the worst booger you've ever seen. It's really amazing stuff, and um, it's it's uh, if you could market it, you'd be rich. Um, but it uh, this is similar. This is this is the mucinous test that I don't know if you've ever worked with the GI docs when they aspirate either serous or mucinous uh, cystadenomas in the pancreas or or anywhere else. This is the test that they do after they get the fluid out to see whether it's more likely to be serous or mucinous. The same applies here. This is, this is exceedingly tenacious mucinous material. And uh, you can see the, the tethering there. So there's an example of uh, this is that same patient pre and post uh, aspiration. And uh, she's had good results. So this, she's about four months out now. We did not put any steroid or high, high uranidase into the, uh, into the uh, cyst itself. Telosynovial interventions are going to be uh, probably our second most common reason for doing an intervention on the wrist or the forearm. Uh, for this, you're going to use a much smaller needle because you're not trying to get fluid out unless uh, you're suspicious for infection, and then you only want to get fluid out. But if you're doing an injection, you can use a much smaller uh, needle, and we typically use a 25-gauge, inch-and-a-half needle, the same one we'll use for our local uh, uh, lidocaine. Shallow needle tra trajectory with uh, placement into the uh, tenon sheath and a uh, relatively small steroid do dose compared to a, a larger joint, uh, for example. This is an example of a uh, Dequervian's tenosynovitis. You can see a thickened uh, first extensor compartment with a fair amount of tenosynovial fluid in the tenon sheath. Longitudinal uh, visualization, you can see again that thickening. Um, and uh, you can see, again, that fine fibrillar pattern within the, uh, within the tendon. Ultrasound, just kind of as a side note, really, really depicts tendons very well. Uh, MRI, I like, but tendons are homogeneously dark, and you don't see the internal structure of the, uh, of the tendons. Uh, ultrasound actually has the ability to resolve the internal structure of the tendons uh, better than MRI, although I'd, um, you know, there are pros and cons to each. So ultrasound, pretty exquisite at demonstrating uh, the tendinous uh, infrastructure. This is an example of the longitudinal needle approach in this Dequervian's tenosynovitis with the needle tip terminating in the distended uh, tendon sheath um, just prior to, uh, to the actual tendon itself. So again, this is a tendon sheath injection, not a tendon injection. And so you're going to get uh, peritendinous fluid within the sheath surrounding that, uh, the tendon. Uh, ultrasound guided aspiration. Uh, usually, two main indications are going to be if you're suspicious for a crystalline arthropathy or if there's uh, any suspicion for a septic arthritis. And uh, this is going to be joint dependent, which, uh, which compartment of the wrist is it in uh, or which joint. This is an example of a carpal effusion aspiration uh, with the second extensor compartment uh, labeled going uh, with the needle uh, on a longitudinal visual visualization going deep to the extensor compartment uh, to the dorsum of the wrist. And this is a pre and post uh, aspiration image. And you can see that the, the fluid in the dorsal recess uh, of the wrist has decreased. That capsule is less distended. So the nice thing about uh, ultrasound guidance is whatever you can imagine and see on ultrasound is a way you can access. So you can be creative. It doesn't have to, you're not limited to your standard planes, uh, axial transfer or axial sagittal coronal. Most of the uh, imaging access that we're using is an off axis plane, not a, a kind of a non-standard plane. 
Carpal tunnel injection, actually, these are probably done more than you realize by your clinical colleagues uh, in, in the clinic. Um, they're done commonly by orthopedic surgeons, uh, sports uh, trained family practice docs, some non sports trained family practice docs, and neurologists. Um, they're very good for short term relief of carpal tunnel syndromes. So they're used in patients who uh, uh, resolution of the syndrome is expected, such as pregnant patients, recently postpartum patients, um, people that don't have long standing carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, I found three approaches described in the literature, and I'll show you each of those. Um, and we may be asked to do them occasionally if the patient is uh, of difficult habitus, making landmarks landmarks difficult to uh, to identify, uh, or perhaps if if the referring provider is just uncomfortable doing them, that would be appropriate as well. Because I would probably be a little nervous about doing it without image guidance as well. I, I can understand that point. So the first is a uh, transverse a needle transverse to the transducer with injection into the space between the flexor tendons with the needle localized halfway between the Guillain's canal and the median nerve. So the needle's nowhere near the median nerve. You're just depositing the steroid uh, in the carpal tunnel itself. Um, the, so if this is a, a diagram of the uh, carpal tunnel, there's your needle. Basically, you'd be depositing the steroid in approximately that location uh, in between the superficial and deep uh, flexor tendons of the forearm. <clears throat> patient's hand is in a neutral flex position to decrease the tension on the uh, tendons and then after the injection they extend and, and uh, flex to allow the spread of that uh, steroid around in the carpal tunnel. <clears throat> the second is a needle placed through the retinaculum uh, with it stopping just short of the median nerve with either transverse or longitudinal visualization. So again with your needle this would just be a straight down approach get through the retinaculum stop before you hit the median nerve. Usually, usually you'll have a two or three millimeters between the retinaculum and the median nerve. And the third a little more convoluted um, is a longitudinal visualization with the transducer to the ulnar nerve starting from a uh, approach um, near Guillain's canal uh, just superficial to the ulnar nerve and artery and passing deep uh, to the uh, deep into the carpal tunnel uh, with the needle deep to the median nerve. This approach has been used uh, if people have um, any kind of uh, fibrosis or granulation tissue from a, a prior surgery, whether it be related to the carpal tunnel or to a prior fracture. And uh, let me uh, give you an example. That would look a needle approach something like this. Now, I know what you're thinking aren't you sacrificing or potentially injuring um, a lot of tendons going this way? If you're using a 25 gauge needle, um, you can do in, generally you do little damage to the to the structures that you pass through. So uh, if you if you do go through some of the myotendinous junctions or, or through the tendons itself, and uh, it's it's usually of, uh, of I think little clinical uh, importance uh, later on. So this is an example of that first approach that I talked about. This is uh, taken from the literature, just of a transverse visualization of the needle. Uh, where you can see the needles placed kind of in the mid portion of the wrist and the medicine uh, gets deposited between the uh, deep and superficial flexor tendons. Um, hand is, uh, fingers are flexed, patient is comfortable, and I particularly like this uh, universal precautions on the sterile technique which was published in this case. <clears throat> Ironically this was done at a clinic in Napa which is about eight miles from my house, uh, just a, pretty close to Travis Air Force Base. Um, so this is a, an example of that same approach. Here's the needle tip uh, in the uh, carpal tunnel itself. You can see the median nerve is far away from your needle tip, Guillain's canal uh, on the opposite side. Second uh, approach that I talked about was this longitudinal visualization with the needle tip terminating just proximal to the median nerve. You could do a transverse approach as well. And uh, this is an example of that third approach uh, coming obliquely. Um, in this case, they're not targeting the median nerve, but they were targeting the flexor pollicis longus, which had uh, some stenosing tenosynovitis, which was a, a complication from a volar plate fixation from a uh, radius fracture. But uh, they're using a saline dissection to uh, kind of peel that off the plate and then put some steroid down. That's the same technique reported for a, a post-operative complication uh, or, or scar tissue surrounding the median nerve. Um, radiocarpal joint injection. Just like you'd imagine, uh, just like you would picture it uh, doing, put the ultrasound transducer on the back of the wrist. That's uh, what the uh, uh, footprint of the transducer is going to look like. And again, remember you've got the radius, you've got the scaphoid. Here's the joint. Remember that little bit of a dorsal ridge or lip of the, of the uh, radius, so you'll approach just like you would a uh, arthrogram with an obliquely oriented needle position to, to engage the joint. 
And uh, I'm just going to wrap up with um, a biopsy of, uh, of the soft tissues. Dr. Campbell talked about the need to consult with, your referring, uh, with the referring provider as well as with the orthopedic on oncologist or the oncologic surgeon so that we don't violate any uh, spaces that may or may not be targeted during the resection. And again, if, um, if you're not going to do it at your institution, then you shouldn't biopsy it at your institution. And that's, that's the case at, uh, at our institution as well. We, uh, a lot of times, we'll diagno diagnose soft tissue masses with uh, MRI or ultrasound. And unfortunately, we don't have a soft tissue pathologist. And so the surgeons will not remove the, the tumor at our institution, but they'll send them to UC Davis or UCSF. And so we end up missing that, that part of the procedure, and then the patient comes back for treatment. So we see the pathology in the end, but we miss, uh, we miss the intervention portion of it. This is an example of a uh, carpal mass, soft tissue mass. And again, it, I could have told you this was uh, in the breast or in the leg or anything like that, but it, it's like any other soft tissue mass. Um, you want to visualize the entire throw of your device so that you know what you're hitting on the far end of that, and uh, you'll get a nice core of tissue. This turned out to be a synovial sarcoma. And uh, this is a synovial biopsy in the dorsum of the wrist. Uh, again, you want to be able to visualize the entire extent of the throw. So in conclusion, uh, ultrasound is great for uh, intervention in the wrist and forearm. It gives you uh, the ability to real-time real image, see the needle, see what you're doing, see the structures, and, uh, and you can kind of do it on the fly, change the, change the orientation if you need to, um, or target other areas if you see some uh, other areas of symptomatology while you're there. The procedures are generally well tolerated with few complications, and uh, those complications uh, that do happen tend to be uh, minor ones such as uh, infection, um, which can be severe, but if you catch them early enough, <laughs> they're minor. And I'll conclude with that.